Hi everyone, hope you enjoyed your coffee break. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is an engineer and material scientist at UCL. Um, his research areas include smart materials and the psychophysical properties of materials. In addition, he's a writer and frequently gives popular talks on materials and engineering to the public. Uh, you may have seen him on fantastic shows like The Genius of Invention and Dara O'Brien's Science Club on the BBC. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Mark Miodalfnik. Thank you. Thank you. So should I be using this or this? Is this better? I'll use this. Does everyone hear me? Yeah, that's better. Okay, okay, good. Hello. Well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to give a talk. It's always great to talk to a different set of people. I really relish that. And um, I'll, I'm going to leave quite a bit of time at the end for questions because <laughs> what I say almost always seems to provoke quite a lot of questions. Um, and I wanted to really kind of um, talk about the wider side of uh, what I do, uh, material science. Um, and I'm going to couch the whole story um, in terms of kind of looking at the world in the way that, uh, that you are and I look at the world from a scientific perspective. And then I'm going to sort of <laughs> see what happens when you kind of really try and drill down on what that actually means about the stuff that everything is built out of, all this stuff around us, our clothes and that sort of thing. Um, OK, so the first thing I want to say is that this is um, a picture actually uh, just on the Strand, not too far away from here. It's a London streetscape. And for those of you not from a material science background, <laughs> um, you might not immediately start just thinking about the materials in that space. I know, it's hard to believe that you don't, you just walk down the road thinking of other thoughts, <laughs> thinking about your life, listening to music. Yes, I know who you are. But the rest of us who, you know, study materials, we're constantly searching out <laughs> little bits of material here and there. And actually, it gets kind of obsessive. Oh, and um, I haven't even tried very hard here to kind of pinpoint all the different materials in that scene. And what it tells you is that we've created this wonderful, complex world. This is the urban jungle that we've created, and it's no less wonderful than a tropical jungle. Um, it just happens to be man-made. Um, and each one of these materials you see here, you know, leather, wood, you might think that's a natural material, but actually the wood in the engineering use of the word is, is actually very, very much of a man-made material. Um, polystyrene, all of these, these are all revolutions. These all change the way that we lived, they change the way that we behaved, they change culture, they change who we were. So in a very real sense, this is an, uh, it's like looking in the mirror you know, at, at what society is and what culture is, where we've come from. It's, um, it's, it's got huge amounts of complexity. You don't really need to go to a museum if you know what you're looking for to, to really reflect on, on the wonderful technology we've created. But the question then arises, where did all this stuff come from? Who made it? And if you're a material scientist at a dinner party, let's say, and someone asks you this question, what do you do, material scientist? Oh, what's that? Oh, it's all this stuff around us, everything. Oh, you made all that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did. Us. Everything else? That's other people, but there isn't anything else, because everything's made of something. Um, and then they, they press you further about what you actually do. You sort of say, oh, I write papers on, or, uh, uh, but it's very important, these stuff, because this stuff, right, you have to understand the internal structure of materials in order to create all this wonderful world. And if you don't understand this, then you can't do any of it, believe me. And they look at you like, what? And I used to interpret those looks like of misunderstanding what I was saying. But now, in retrospect, I see it as <laughs> them seeing through me. Because as they probably knew, most people know, the world's a lot more complicated than this, even though this looks complicated. And the truth is that this is the material science way of looking at the world. It's about scale. And as I was saying, you know, each one of us who does material science, we spend a little different times studying different scales. So I don't have to explain this diagram to you guys, but obviously this is a scale bar in the middle. And this is the living world on this side. This is the inanimate world. And of course, you know, physicists, ab initio, quantum mechanicus, you know, they, they spend a lot of time at this scale down here. People who build nanostructures spend a lot of time at this scale. People who build silicon chips fiddle around with little transistors. And the, and the paper, the part of the paper you just saw there, was all about the inside of these little crystals here and looking at the dislocations within them and how they change the shape of the crystal. 
Now, all of us, you know, we, we have our different scales and we all maybe spend a whole lifetime in that scale working out something about materials, something about the world around us. But that's not what a material is. A material isn't just one of these scales, even though people talk about nanotechnology or they talk about the atomistic, or they even talk about a technology like a phone. So what is a material? And if you look at any materials textbook, you will not find a definition. <laughs> Because it really, it really is very difficult to, to actually define what a material is. People mean very different things about the, the word material. And the way I'm going to talk about it is the material science way of talking about it, which is that it's, it's to do with knowing which scale affects which property. So scale is really important, structure, and the different structures of each scale. Now, that means that there is no real cutoff point for what makes a material important to a certain set of people. In a way, a building is a material in the same way that a nanotube is a material because there are structures at a different scale. Now, it just happens that architectures, our architects uh, talk about materials in a very different way. They talk about them in terms of much bigger structures, but essentially, that's not inconsistent. So the question is then, how do you be a material scientist or how do you be any other sort of material sci scientist who's dealing with one of these different scales and really start to worry about the scales ab above, like all the bits of technology that get made up here and how, what the relative importance of your bit is. And I want to sort of talk about that um, by looking at the history of materials because history is very important to get the handle right because although we live in the 21st century and we've just come out of the 20th century which is probably the biggest revolution in materials that there's ever been more new materials are created in the last hundred years than ever before in history nevertheless actually history is, is not to be disregarded um, and I want to just talk about it in terms of um, uh, not these materials but one material which is oh no, sorry yeah is at the heart of this, which is a, a scarab, um, which was found um, in the tomb of Tutankhamun, right? So an Egyptian uh, ruler. And at the, at the center of the scarab is not a diamond, it's not a ruby, it's not a, any sort of jewel that we would recognize. That's a piece of glass. And that's not just any piece of glass, that's what's called desert glass. So obviously there's a lot of sand and they worked out the Egyptians that you could turn sand into glass, but they couldn't do it very well and they couldn't do it, make it really transparent get really transparent glass like this is very, very hard. You need to have a very strong control of the chemistry and of the temperature. And they couldn't do either of those two things. But they found this glass, and, it, and it's, it's not desert glass, uh, which is caused by lightning strikes, which are called fulgurites, which, which look like kind of <laughs> sand that's been made into a, into a lightning bolt. Um, but it's, 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 it's probably uh, much earlier than this, sort of 30 million years old. So it predates. <laughs> much of human civilization. And, and, and it's thought that it must have been caused by a big meteor crash into the desert, caused such high temperatures, into an area where there's pure quartz, which is near Libya. So they, they understood that this was some sort of glass. They understood what glass was. It was transformation of one material into another. And that transformation is presumably what, one of the things they valued most about it. But they couldn't make it, not like this. Um, and if you fast forward in time, um, you go, you go to the east and you, you find that actually the Chinese and the Japanese and the Thai and all the eastern cultures, they, they took forward glass quite a lot. Um, but they didn't ever sort of use it monolithically, not until the late 19th century. Before that, they were producing the best ceramics that you've ever seen, that the world's ever seen. It's actually never been bettered. And I want to show you just two examples here. Um, this is from a book by C.S. Uh, Smith, Cyril Stanley Smith, who was a great metallurgist. Uh, of the 20th century and also a historian of art and he went around museums in the world look, with the microscope looking at their intricate microstructures and he found that these bowls here from the 11th century they had a particular jewel-like quality in their surface and it was caused by these tiny little bubbles and so the, the people who were making this they were, they were controlling bubble size in the glaze right, really accurately in order to get a, a, this optical effect but they didn't have thermometers and they had no chemistry as we knew it. And here is an example of a, of a sort of, um, it's called a, 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 a small little crystal growing in a glassy phase. And they managed to, they saw that they growed in like a flower-like pattern and they could control the size and shape of them. And you get this really beautiful oil spot bowl. So you've got people who don't understand science who are nevertheless controlling microstructure and they're doing so very knowingly. 
Um, if we then go back to the West, we find that glass has been revered, that the Romans took it forward, they, they invented glass, blowing glass, they invented using glass as a vessel. So they, they invented the idea that you would have, um, you would drink out of a, a, a transparent vessel, and therefore the color of a liquid would matter. Um, they invented windows. <laughs> so uh, it's quite interesting uh, juxtaposition between the East and the West in glass, because the, the East never uses glass monolithically, only uses it as a glaze. Um, and so the window doesn't arise in the East, and nor does the lens, which some people point to as a reason why, even though Eastern technology was far ahead of the West for, th for hundreds, if not thousands of years, it actually never made it to the point where it got modern science as we know it. Whereas in the West, uh, glass was used really decoratively, it was used as, a, as to create windows, it was used to create stained glass for cathedrals. So it was, it was driven by the, again, by the artisans, and they could cut glass, which meant they could polish it. And Galileo nicked the idea of a telescope from the Dutch, and instead of looking out to sea, which is what the Dutch were doing to speculate on futures of certain commodities that were coming out from, from, from different distant lands <laughs> and then changing the price of the market before the ship came into, into the market, which is quite clever, um, <laughs> uh, he looked up. So he got less money out of it. And, uh, but um, he saw that there were moons around Jupiter, for instance. He, he, he saw that the moon itself wasn't smooth and he could make sketches of these things. And this, of course, was a revolution. So without the lens, without glass, a transparent um, lens, right, you can't really do it with any other material. You don't get this huge birth of understanding of the solar system and astronomy and all of that stuff. Now, the people who made his lenses weren't the scientists. They were the, they were the people who made chandeliers. And they were the people who knew how to do it. Um, and then, of course, it's the arts who bring forward even though they're not talking about it in the same way, but they bring forward notions of chemical etching. So this is etched on the Peter Boy piece, beautiful. This is the sort of bit of glass you, a king or a queen would have next to their bed uh, before retiring with some water in it with a beautiful lid to protect it from the dust. Yeah, why don't we have that these days? Good idea. Uh, okay, um, but we don't. Uh, and this is um, enameled. So the idea of, of enameling a piece of glass without shattering it and, of course, gilding it all of these amazing materials techniques developed really without anything we would call today of a kind of scientific attitude towards the material. And yet they did it. And here's a, here's a really big one. Anyone idea what this is? It's, it has a big effect on science, but it isn't made by scientists. It's close. It's a, huh? it's a, it's a test tube. <laughs> it's one of the first test tubes. And so imagine chemistry. Imagine chemistry without glass, right? The, the, the subject's almost defined by it. Go to any lab. You'll see glass everywhere. Why? It's the perfect material to do reactions. It's inert. Before this, the alchemists knew that reactions were happening, a new transformation was happening. But they had to look down into a hearth, into a crucible. And in fact, they got smoke in their eyes and their hair. And they actually went mad. Um, this is, you know, a, a recorded fact. You know, they sacrificed themselves <laughs> for science. And then, then... Of course, chemists are probably no less mad today, but uh, they can't blame their equipment anymore um, <laughs> because glass is perfect. Like, you can see a transformation because you can see a color change or you can see precipitation. Before a transparent, transparent vessel comes along, you can't see any of these things accurately. Um, you can heat it up and have a thermometer. You can do all these things with glass. So it's just an incredibly brilliant material, but again, nurtured by the arts, understood by the arts, and then given to science and revolutionizes science, creates chemistry, really. Um, another revolution in, in, in glass is, is this Pilkerton uh, plate glass technology. So before this, um, glasses were all small panes, and that's because no one could make it defect-free, really, any bigger than that. And Pilkerton realized that the reason was that if you make glass the old-fashioned way, which is pouring it onto a, a platen, a, a steel platen, and then basically rolling it out with a rolling pin, which is essentially what they did with pins, what happens is that the smallest defect size is, 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 the, is to do with the surface of the metal platen, which is, which is you know, polished, nicely done, but it's still going to have small defects in it. So if you want, if you want atomic defect-free surface of glass, what do you do? You pour it onto a liquid metal. It's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and you get plate glass, okay? And this is still how it's done today. Um, and in fact, if you see the architecture, 
at the front of Imperial College today. <laughs> you see it in the city. It is all to do with the fact that glass in big sheets was mastered in the sort of early 20th century. Um, people were playing around with glass in different ways. So this is, uh, this is what happens when you take glass and you, and you just pull it out into tiny little fibres. And then, of course, someone realised, a guy called Griffiths, that if you, if you bend those, they're really strong. They're hugely strong. And so there's this big kind of theoretical question, why is a fibre of glass strong and a plate of glass, you know, made from the same stuff, weak? And this is all called, to do with defect sizes and, and other things, but, but other people took this and made jaws because this is fiberglass, and almost all the special effects of the you know, early 20th century science, all those films we adore, fiberglass. <laughs> and um, most small vessels, most small boats are made of fiberglass now. So composites, and, 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 it, and it's kind of uh, the, you know, the next one along, which is called ca carbon fiber. These are all born by this mucking about with fibers of glass. And then, of course, you work out that if you have fibers of glass, that you can send light down them and Actually, light doesn't go in straight lines. It can go around corners. In fact, it can go round and round and round in circles. And of course, you have the telecoms industry of the optical fibre. So, um, so recently there was a, a vote. In fact, it ended last night by organised by the Science Museum and the Royal Academy of Engineering and a few other people. And uh, optical fibres was one of the top voted inventions of the 20th century, British inventions of the 20th century, um, as was Pilkington float glass. <laughs> but the one that came top was. Anyone know? Uh, you, all, you haven't been looking at Twitter? Fine, that's good. <laughs> um, anyway, that was the Turing machine, um, fo followed closely by the Mini. <laughs> now, there was outrage on Twitter that the Mini was even in contention, right? This is the Mini, the car, the Mini, right? Why was the Mini even in contention, everyone said, to something like the Turing machine? Alan Turing, what a geni piece of genius, and, and all the optical fiber, but, OK. And, and, and I think the answer comes down to, oh, sorry, yeah. Answer comes down to, to scale again, which is that, that there are some people who, who think abstractly about the world, and they're very comfortable in abstract world. And in, in order to live down here, in order to, to spend your life studying this bit of science down here, you have to be an abstract thinker. You have to enjoy that. But the majority of the world are not an abstract thinker, and actually they think up here of objects. But that doesn't make them any less intelligent. It doesn't make them any less innovative. Because you've seen with the history of glass, which has transformed science and society in so many ways, that actually people who think up here can still control the microstructure. Because actually, the whole material is still there. Even if, you're not, even if you don't have the words for it or the equations for it, or if you don't have the microscopes to see it, you can still control this, this bit down here. You're doing it in a different way. And that doesn't make you. That doesn't actually make you um, less important. And in the history of glass, it's definitely true. So most of, the, most of the innovations happen without this knowledge of the different structures of glass. Um, now, of course, we know that color can be controlled down here at the atomic scale and transparency. Likewise, you really need to know what these atomic bonds are doing and which elements you're putting in there and what you know, transition states they're in. And, you all, and, and things like biocompatibility, so, so there's a thing called bioglass, which you can put into your body and that turns into bone. These things people know, you know, they're to do with actually the size, some of the sizes of the pores, really important, and obviously the surface chemistry. But so much of what's happened to glass and where it came from, and the fact that we actually have science at all, you might argue, <laughs> certainly the fact that we have microscopes and telescopes, um, is due to a whole set of people who didn't know any about, anything about this. And so that shows you that you can really do amazing things in the world without this theoretical knowledge. So what are we to make with that? Well, I think my, my perspective is this, which is that materials, which let's say we agree, it's everything is made from something. So they are a pretty amazing set of things, but they're not only made by material scientists. They're not only made by physicists and chemists and biologists and chemical biologists. They're actually made by a lot of people. And in fact, there's a network of people all seeing the world from different scales, from different perspectives. Some people experience it through their mouth, other people through their hands, other people, probably the majority in this room, and I include myself amongst us, <laughs> through our brain. You know, we have to write down an equation to really understand a material, but that, that is only one way of looking at a material. So um, we had this idea that if that's true, then, then we need we need to reflect that in how we present the subject. Um, and we need to have those links. And we need to also try and 
have, when we do projects where we're going to make a new material, although it seems obvious that in order to make a new material, you need to be very highly versed in science and engineering. But I would say, actually, you need, you need a lot of help from these people too, because different people have, the material has to live in the world. It has to be made from someone. It has to, has to find its way in the world. It has to be part of culture. Right? And those, the people who understand those things, they're no less important in making a material really make it into the world. Not just a lab prototype, but really become part of culture of who we are. So how to do that? Well, here's our go at it. Uh, obviously, I was talking about scale. So you need representatives from different scales in the team. And so up here, you need architects, and you need, you need people who understand fashion. <laughs> um, you need people who understand design, you need people who understand electronics, and, and so on. And so we start building a team, and uh, Martin is a designer, Zoe is an artist, Graziella actually comes from a dance background, Supina is a jeweler, um, Ellie is a ceramicist, Sarah is an anthropologist, and Richard is an engineer. And this is, this is the core team, in fact Graziella has left us now. but. Um, but but we've, we've, we've um, oh, and Phil, who's now at Imperial, in fact, <laughs> uh, is a physicist. So um, with this team, and not everyone was involved in every project, but I'm just giving you a flavor of what we've been doing over the last few years. We tried to build objects that embody the science because when you have something at this scale, people can understand it much more readily and they can interact with it. So tuning forks is a really good idea because Mostly, people think of tuning forks as immaterial. In, a, in other words, they are a note. Bong! <laughs> or bong! And we, we made them all the same shape, but different materials. Of course, that means it changes the sound. But it changes more than the sound. It changes the feeling of them. It changes their, it changes their meaning. And of course, we didn't just test it by doing the normal thing, which is you know, to record the sound and try and work out the resonant frequency. But we also just gave them to musicians. And we said, maybe you want to compose something with these, or maybe this provokes something in you, or, uh, you know, we don't know what, in fact. Um, and um, we did the same for spoons. So we made, although, <laughs> this is another story, but although, of course, we all have stainless steel now, so we no longer are like our ancestors, where the spoon material actually had a huge effect on the flavor of our dish. We've all got stainless steel, which is almost tasteless. But we, we, we reversed that historical moment, and we went back and made copper, uh, copper, chrome, gold, silver, zinc, tin, something, I've forgotten now. <laughs> anyway, another material. And um, we, we did blind taste tests on people and we did the science. So we worked out that actually something that no one had worked out before, which was that the electro potential, it's pretty obvious, I suppose, right? But anyway, the electro, we, we got data, right, for the first time in the world, which is that, you know, the electro potential really affects the taste. And, and bitter things like zinc are bitter because you get a huge amount of uh, reaction um, components in your mouth. But that's not the whole story because the taste is, is influenced by what you see in front of you. And it's also, in, in, it's also influenced by what you think of as a spoon. And um, so we did much more than that. We sort of looked at whether, how much you could predict of the taste and feel of things by just looking up the physical properties like electropotential and like a thermal, thermal heat capacity and thermal conductance, and how much was actually down to the person's own perception, whether they could see the spoon or not in their mouth or not, so they knew what was in their mouth or not. And these things mattered. Um, and, um, and we played around <laughs> as well. Um, and what else did we do? I'm running out of time. Oh, yes, and we did a meal where we actually designed with a Michelin star chef, where we said, look, here are the spoons. They all taste, a lot of them taste terrible, okay? But <laughs> see what you can do. And then developed a menu in which actually the zinc spoon was actually went really well with curried prawns, it turned out, <laughs> which you would never have thought. And also we started, to, immediately we did this, and this is Heston Blumenthal who we invited, and another guy called Harold McGee, who's like the god of science of food. I mean, if, you, if anyone knows on food and cooking, it's 25 years old, it's absolutely amazing. So to get him in the room with our spoons was amazing. <laughs> and um, and what, what came out of these conversations was that a chef or, you know, might think of these spoons in a totally different way than we think of them. But also medics, he had medics in, along and they said, you know what, your taste changes when you get ill. And actually it can be a predictor of disease, even quite serious diseases like breast cancer. 
So what if you could, des could you design a spoon for us that basically you used every morning to eat your cereal and maybe it did taste a bit funky, but if you could taste the funkiness, you were not ill. <laughs> and then one day it doesn't taste funky anymore and then you should go to the doctor. Could, is that possible? And we don't know the answer because it's ongoing, but it's an exciting project. Um, and also, we thought, you know what? We need to tell people about the complexity of these things. So we, we, we've got to engage with the media. And this is um, a program I did with um, the BBC on, on materials, which was filmed, some, some of it was filmed in Imperial as well, with uh, Molly Stevens' lab. Um, so here is the basic methodology which we're adopting at the moment uh, in the thing we're calling the Institute of Making, which opened last week, or was it the week before? It's a bit of a blur at the moment. Um, and the idea is that the space has materials in it, but it also has places to make objects. Because if we can't make the objects, then we can't do this methodology. And if we can't make the, the methodology, we can't invite these other people in. They, they cannot discuss the paper with us. They cannot discuss the equation with us, but they can discuss the spoon. They can discuss the sets of spoons. And actually, that changes everything, because then they're included. And, and materials is just a brilliant way of doing that, because there is just no end to it, what you can make. Um, so this is the, the heart of the Institute, and we have a physical space with a materials library and a make space where hopefully you can make pretty much anything. Um, we're, sort of, we're serious about this side of it because actually in the past we found that people feed in really good ideas from our dinners, talks, TV, radio, festivals. You know, that idea about the spoon and whether you could detect um, a disease, you know, that didn't come from us sitting down and writing a grant application. That, that came from doing an event where a medic turned up. And that medic would never come into our lab any other way. So actually, these are actually weirdly good ways of meeting people in your own university <laughs> who wouldn't otherwise know about your work, but they'll come to an event or see a TV program and actually then contact you. So this stuff actually does help. Um, and it does feed in meaningfully. These arrows, I really mean it. They, it comes back in to your research. Um, and then over here, of course, once we've got some good ideas and once we've made our objects, then we have to study them. And then some big questions hopefully arise. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're doing a project on making an exoskeleton, uh, which you wear underneath your clothes, which would learn your gait. And so when you were feeling, well, if you, if you basically messed your knee up or you, you had an injury or you were old and infirm and you, you're needing a stick to walk or a pair of crutches, this thing would help you walk without crutches. And the important thing here is to note that not only is it a technological challenge, which is probably just about achievable now, in terms of, of integrating actuators, sensors, um, and trying to get the electronics right, as well as making a holistic material that feels good, that people will wear, that, doesn't, that they trust. So you need to have a lot of different people involved right from the beginning of this, because there are some avenues that are just not going to work. Um, yeah, so that's it, really. So, so that's ongoing, and that's what I wanted to say. There's the Institute. <laughs> it's actually got a bit further than that. Uh, it's now fully decked out. And it has a materials library that looks like that, and well, that's a bit of it. And in a way, this comes back to that original picture I showed you right at the beginning, which is that this is the streetscape sort of taken apart. Now, disciplines are really important. Material science is a discipline, physics, chemistry, biology, they're all disciplines. And I'm not saying that none of them are important. It's really important that those disciplines and those departments exist. In a way, it's like, you know, these, one of these, the materials is a kind of a part of someone's life, you know, you can just spend your whole life studying that one material. But there needs to be a place where it all comes together, where disciplines can mix, where you put all this together and you make society, you make a streetscape, you make, you know, someone's house. And that place shouldn't be just where designers meet, because that's essentially what happens now, right? Most of the stuff in your life is made by designers without very much <laughs> input from anyone else. Um, and science engi engineers have got a lot to offer um, and creating spaces where everyone's happy to collaborate is the hard bit, I think. And so we think that the objects, if, if you have a place where objects live and science and engineering lives in the same place, somehow, and if it doesn't feel weird, and that's the hard bit, and we, we, we're new to this, right? We haven't been doing it that long. Then, um, then magic might happen. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, yeah, so we have events, masterclass and talks, yeah, and, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that we, 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 we hold regular work, uh, workshops trying to come up with new projects. So if any of you are interested, th these are some that have come out of previous workshops and, and other collaborations. 
uh, which are ongoing. But if anyone's interested in, in creating new workshops or just seeing how we work, uh, then do, do email me, because we've got one coming up, but there'll be others. And uh, with that, I will say I'm open for questions. How about a spoon that tastes fine until you get ill, and then <laughs> when you get ill? Brilliant! I don't know why I didn't think of that. That is, that is brilliant. You're right. No. <laughs> okay, so the spoon thing. I mean, actually, so it's a great idea. I think you'll all agree. The question is how to do it. Is it really possible? It feels very science fiction-y. And I think it's a great challenge, you know. Anyone out there who has some ideas about it, we'd really like to hear from you. Because I think... Actually, as a product, we, the other thing, we, the other product we're thinking of is a toothbrush, right? So I know everyone puts toothpaste on their toothbrush, but it is something you put in your mouth every evening, and you contemplate, right? It's a moment of contemplation, isn't it? Who doesn't do this? <laughs> and actually, it's not just your teeth you're worrying about. You, you're looking at the whole thing, right? And and what if what if you could change people's rituals? So actually, that contemplative moment was a health was just a health check moment, and so actually. Actually, you could think of changing a toothbrush into something that, first of all, just, you just sucked on it. Does it taste like it should? <laughs> and you had some sort of tick box rating. I'm not sure, because the problem with taste is it's very subjective. But I'm serious. I mean, I think if you could get that right, you, could, you actually could detect diseases. Could, you could probably detect diseases much, much earlier. And you could save a lot of people's lives with something that seems just like a, a sort of fancy design problem. But it's not a fancy design problem, because... The designers can't solve it. They have to have the chemists and the material scientists and the engineers involved to say, solve it. But it's not clear to me how to, how to do the problem. But anyway, I, I'm interested in ideas. I think um, working with designers is really important. It's really interesting what they're doing. I was just wondering, how, how do you find the, the interface between them? Because design is quite rapid. The iteration cycle is very quick. But you come to the science center, it's a lot slower process. How does that work? Yeah, well, we're still finding out, and you're absolutely right, that is one of the biggest problems. So what we've tried to do in the, up till now is we're not trying to solve problems that designers bring to us because they almost always have a very quick problem to solve, and we're probably not the best people to help them solve that. But we hope to point them in directions where they go. So we try to set a problem which does have a long time frame, and actually we're hoping that we can provide something to designers and architects too who have the same problem, which is that... They, after 10 years of working in that, that, that kind of um, field, they long to do something which has got a bit of a longer, you know, it's got a bit more to bite into. And so we, in a way, we're sort of giving them a holiday from short-term problems and saying, one day a week, give us one day a week, and, and we'll work on a three-year, five-year, because we, we can't change our time frames, really. Just the way universities are set up, you know what it's like, PhD students, and there's just, that is just a, that is the... Um, that's the time unit of research, isn't it? <laughs> the ultimate time unit of research. But you're right, yeah. So, so it's, it's about agenda setting and, and trust. In fact, working with people over time. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. So let's thank Mark again. For the